are online just a teeny little bit early. Let's get our um, um, opening logos going here. Welcome to Evolution Hour on today, the 11th of August, 2021, a time far removed from analog clocks and uh, typewriters. And there's the uh, tortukanwordpress.com, which is my website that has all the old material on it. Share all of that away. That That's exactly what it's there for. Um, and there we are stopping that, and away we go on that. So um, we have uh, Jackson Wheat here, which may or may not be able to hear much because of the weirdities of Louisiana steam-powered internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And let me also go ahead and um, thank our um, patrons, just in case we have difficulties with the internet from my end of the thing. I'd like to thank everybody who has actually ponied up scratch and continues to do so. Uh, Hendrel, Colton, Eric, uh, Sura, Seshi, researchers, Travis, Ian, Kabertney, Stephen, Eat, James, History, Ralph, Apologia, Benjamin, Speed of Sound, Studio, Assistant Researchers, Command, Doranku, Jelly, The Lavender, Lady Totus, Rial, Christopher Johnson, our friend Steve, Barry Gale, uh, uh, Daniel Insects, Morton, Paul, Puffalophagus, Bo, Devin, New Patron, Slava, who we just had a nice long chat with. Um, he's in Eastern Europe, so it was tricky doing a Zoom meet there, but he was talking to me about the methodology that I use and how I construct information and, and, and do research and the like. Alex and Paul, and then on the bottom there are legacy patrons who were able to help at one time or another. I'm still gonna thank you. Jen, Jody, Mike, John, Keith, Andrew, Dyer, Uyui, Mona, Brad, Daniel, Nana, Staggles, Sun, Ugly German, Trulz, Everett, and Sewer. Uh, everybody there is uh, been helping in one way or another, and I will continue to uh, thank everybody on that route. So, um, as you probably know by now, uh, the exciting world of replacing Darwin, which doesn't, uh, Nathaniel Jensen's uh, tome on arguing effectively the position that everything is really only 6,000 years old, and he can prove it genetically. And uh, hi, I see uh, Lisa, Scott, hi, all in the, um, the chat line there. Hi. Up, up. There we go. And um, um, Jensen has been basically repeating a lot of his own material, waving it as if it were valid. And um, he repeats, then he gets back to... <coughs> Uh, Jackson dro dropped out. He may be back in later. <clears throat> he um, repeats um, what is called in the biz an unrooted uh, tree, where you are looking at the various genes of things and you're able to show um, branching from um, a core genetic sequence, but it's not the same thing as an actual evolutionary relationship because it needs to be rooted against an external measure to be able to focus at that. And Jensen has had a tendency to offer these trees. Uh, ah, Jackson is returned. Let's get him back on the speed in here. Ah, welcome back, Jackson. I was just explaining rooted versus unrooted trees. Perhaps you'd like um, care to, to wing that one uh, in more detail of where Jackson uh, Jensen is gumming up in an awful lot of his analyses. And we are not hearing Jackson. Okay, I will then continue. Uh, to pretend that I am Jackson at this point. Um, Jensen makes a big deal about uh, that there were three haplogroups that were identified in this. And he isn't explicitly implying that this is like the children of Noah. We'll see whether or not he actually drops that little blip later on in the tale. But that's functionally what he's arguing about. Problem is there's more haplotypes than that. And he makes the terrible mistake of actually citing another technical paper here, one that I hadn't been aware of, by the way, previous to this, uh, by Underhill and Kibbisid. Uh, Jackson's trying again. Let's get you tried again on this. Um, Underhill and Kibbisid, uh, 2007, it was a very nice little analysis, really very nice. And I've got open access on it, so I'll be putting that link in the uh, stuff in due course on um, working out uh, human migrations based on um, the various haplogroups. And although Jensen explicitly says there's the L, M, and N haplogroups, 
this paper already is talking about additional haplogroups than that. And um, Jensen goes to even the mistake of in the footnote where he links uh, to the Underhill and Kibbleslub paper, he says, quote, see also any recent mtDNA paper. So he's kind of implying that the three haplogroups are just the whole game and that this has been recognized for a very long time and just, you know, look up the stuff, kids. Problem is, is that paper went into way more detail on that and mentioned quite a few of the other haplogroups, uh, C, D, E, and F, uh, that uh, relate to this, that um, resolved uh, uh, previous issues. Um, the paper explicitly says they're describing, quote, new results concerning Y chromosome founder haplogroups C, D, E, and F. D, E is all together as a single thing. Uh, that resolved their previous trifurcation and improved the harmony with the uh, mitochondrial DNA recapitulation of the out of Africa migration. Oh, Jackson, poor Jackson, is just trying to get in here. Um, and moreover that, we've got the problems with the dating, that if he's going to bring this stuff up, he needs to deal with it. He doesn't discuss the C haplogroup at all. I'm going to be putting in a link to um, a 2010 analysis that lists off a bunch of stuff on uh, the DNA haplogroup C that points out it appears to have arisen uh, shortly after modern humans left Africa and is estimated to be approximately 50,000 years old. And they list a slew of papers on this, which include the Underhill paper from 2007. None of them are any, obviously, any later than 2010, because this was a 2010 posting. How then did our little buddy boo Jensen not know about any of this information when writing in 2017? <laughs> it's almost like he's not letting his readers know all the information. And so it's going to be funky to see whether anywhere in the notes or elsewhere he ever alludes to these other haplogroups. I'm not sure whether Jackson is operational in volume zone or uh, uh, speak, Jackson, please. Nope, we're not getting anything from you. Okay. Uh, Jackson, is, is oh, there, hear me? we're getting a teeny blip. I think you're still in the roboting mode. Yeah, yeah, it's um we can, can hear you, stray can sound hear little a little tiny bit, yeah. So I've been trying to carry the ball on the uh the haplotype matter. And uh, what amazes me about that is is Jensen going out of his way to bring up a paper that is seriously um a problem. Oh, Lisa brings up a very good point, which is going to be discussed in length in um, the Rocks Were There, Volume 2, where we're discussing human evolution. How do they explain the fact that Neanderthals have a totally different genome? Oh, gosh, they don't. <laughs> That's part of the little problem on there is they it's part it has become absolute dogma in the um, creation science circles that Neanderthals are just slightly unusual human beings. And while this was a potentially defendable argument 20 years ago, before we started getting exact DNA from Neanderthals, and before we had even more examples of juvenile Neanderthals and others to see tooth eruption patterns and skull suture formation and a whole bunch of other stuff going on, um, that it's utterly untenable to argue that, that Neanderthals are the same species as we are. And um, so they're in a terrible mess. There, bye bye, Jackson again. Poop, he disappeared. Um, I, I think I think the uh, the internet connections down there are just such crap that um, um, I'm not holding my fingers crossed that he will be able to come in. But you are here in spirit, even if not in actual practice. So the funky little part about all of this haplogroup group issue is that um, other people have paid attention to this Underhill work as well. And one of them that just jumped out at me is I thought was terribly hilarious is a posting from the Mormon church, the official Mormon church, um, about um, the implications that these haplogroups have uh, regarding uh, Native Americans. See, young earth creationists aren't the only one with an intractable dogma. More about the peoples in the Americas being the lost tribes of Israel. So they should really all be a bunch of slightly modified Jews. And 
as should not be a surprise, there has been no corroboration of this in genetics. And the Mormons at least are honest enough to go, this is a problem we can't really find a solution to. So probably we should not be making arguments along that line. Maybe not. Well, let's go back to the scripture and let's try to work it out that way. Blah, 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 blah. So I'll be putting a posting up uh, on that from the Mormon church, which uh, is directly alluding to quite a lot of technical literature. In fact, it, it's clear that they, this has been something that they're paying attention to as well. They should, because it's a matter of a dogma that is just slamming flat in to a serious difficulty with the, uh, the genetic material. And uh, the, the problem that Lisa brings up is, is only worse because of the Denisovans, which started out as like a finger and some DNA. The, the, the geneticists, as they've worked through the DNA of, of early human beings and existing human beings, because we've got now a lot of examples, dozens or more, I think, of, of archaic humans that go back 10, 20, 30,000, 40, 50,000 years, uh, where you can extract complete DNA and Neanderthals, we can do the same thing. And so to other groups. Um, oh, hence to say that James does a pretty good Jackson, almost can see no difference. Um, in the sense that I closely resemble a black image with just a J on the screen. And apart from that, we're absolutely identical. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm far more desiccated uh, than uh, uh, Jackson is uh, operating at a third of my age, and, and that's the way it goes on it. But anyway, uh, he is here definitely in spirit one way or the other. Um, as the DNA has been uncovered, uh, they realize that there's not just the Neanderthals and even the Denisovans. There's at least one other mystery population that shows indications of, of DNA that has been interbred with the human species. So there's been some boinking going on in addition to the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. We're starting to get a little more physical fossils. I think a jaw has just shown up from the Denisovans. Uh, but this other group, we don't know anything about them. Uh, there's no DNA extant. There's no fossils extant. So we don't even know the physical area that they lived in and how dynamic they were. They're just this little fossil blip, like a little iceberg uh, blipping around in there. Oh, oh probably not Java Man, uh, Lisa. This is uh, uh, likely a group, uh, perhaps an offshoot of uh, Homo erectus in the same sense that Neanderthals and Denisovans and that are. Um, because we can't look at the DNA, when we get that far back, when we start trying to analyze bunches that are a half a million years ago, too much DNA degradation. And so you, you can't get at that easily. Uh, so it all depends on being able to find relatively recent fossils that you can extract DNA from. You can get them from teeth. There's a whole bunch of, of ways of doing it. And it depends on the bone and the preservation state and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, if I were a creationist, I wouldn't want to bet the house on the scientists never finding additional information here. They may be lucky and we may never actually find uh, physical representations for this mystery third group. You may not find many more examples of that. Oh, hi, hi, creation myths. Yeah, there we go. Uh, just got here and see the title of unrooted haplotype groups. Yes, damn. Uh, by the way, uh, I've got the link in... Um, uh, uh, science friends and that over on Twitter. If you want to jump in as, as in-house expert, I'm perfectly happy uh, to have you joining on. Uh, Jackson has been having ups and downs trying to get in on Louisiana internet in there. So if you want to have the thing uh, and uh, join in there. I was trying to summarize it that Jensen was again trying to put up an unrooted tree and mentioning just three haplotype groups, um, M, uh, L, and N, not mentioning uh, that there are other haplotype groups, uh, C, D, E, and F, that the very paper that Jensen linked to, this Underhill and uh, Cavissild 2007, explicitly was discussing. It was one of the major topics of the paper. And yet, whoop, it manages not to be brought out um, in, uh, in any of his discussion or in the, in the vague notes that was going on. Uh, so... Um, um, I was not terribly impressed with that. And uh, for Dan's benefit, I'll repeat the thing that I'm, I'm putting, I'll be putting in a link to that and a 2010 linkage uh, to um, an analysis of that C haplotype group that was suggesting that it was probably uh, 50,000 years old and related to a very specialized area 
Uh, and um, also how the Mormons, bless them, uh, were even paying attention to this genetic data at a level more sophisticated than Jensen. So Jensen's got a, a big problem to deal with from a methods point of view when you can clearly observe him um, pointing out works which contain information that is extremely relevant to the point he's trying to make and he neglects to mention any of it. That's the omission issue, which is the major way that anti-evolutionists manage to make their case. So I'll, I'll go meta here and point out that although creationists are perfectly capable of making head up their ass mistakes, it's relatively a minor feature of their major reason why they screw up. And, and the main reason is not when they're explicitly making a false statement as Jensen and Tompkins and others have done in terms of mutation rates and all this other stuff where they make like this one boner and then build a whole argument based on the boner. Most of it involves data suppression. Now, to what extent their brains are doing this consciously versus they're just not really looking at it um, is a thing I don't need to determine. I can only observe them not bringing up the subject not discussing the data field, not relating all of that relevant information. And, um, <laughs> ah, yes, the, uh, they don't read technical literature. How dare you blaspheme? I will say the average creationist on the street objectively does not read the technical literature, even on their own side. Uh, I know this and anybody that follows me on Twitter that, that, that hangs in and uh, over my shoulder and watches who I interact with and others will notice that the average Twitter creationist is not in the habit of citing technical literature unless they have glommed onto it from some secondary source. So they have read a reference to it in Nathaniel Jensen or somebody or a website they got from AIG, blah, blah. They copy it off very carefully, usually the whole bloody link. And they think now they understand it because, oh, there's a science paper that they've a, a reference. But how many of them have actually read them is quite another matter because I make it a point of saying, oh, you brought that up. Well, let's talk about that, shall we? And other people are doing exactly the same thing. And at that point, you can just hear the little scamper, scamper, scamper uh, as they run off into, uh, hi, Benjamin Simpson uh, is in the chat. Um, uh, I have, uh, um, thank you very much. One of our patrons of the channel, um, give a nod out to you for uh, helping out in that. Um, it keeps the social security retiree able to muddle on one month to the next to work on the uh, project. Um, uh, before I get on to part two, which will also involve a shameless book plug for the rocks were there. I'll um, give a little reprise up, which I, uh, Jackson would have been discussing um, stuff that he was working on, on his end of the book. He's going into Gunter Beckley on the Cambrian explosion. He's uh, uh, Gunter Beckley is the in-house paleontologist at the Discovery Institute and is really vague as to figuring out what the heck he thinks happened. I'm currently working on the Big Slosh chapter, Tales of the Big Slosh, which is um, uh, covering the mythology around uh, that, the Noah's Ark, uh, the people who think they found Noah's Ark, um, the uh, um, world of, of the supposed flood world that created the Grand Canyon and um, a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be in there and additional material later on when we're discussing in another chapter of the paleo worlds that creationists try to concoct versus the real paleo worlds that we can actually see from the geology. Uh, right there, I, I have finished now the, the, the section on Behemoth and Leviathan and now I've been moving into where Bl Bodhi Hodge, bless his little heart, um, did a whole bloody chapter in one of the answers books uh, where he just repeats all of the worst claptrap of the young earth creationist movement on the, the Cambodian stegosaur that was supposedly uh, painted in the, uh, made a picture of it in a, a relief in the 1200s uh, AD um, and the um, a supposed uh, pictographs of pterosaurs down in the Southwest uh, US and the uh, supposed dinosaur pictographs and all of which involve spectacular misrepresentation of the actual data in part because I don't think Hoge did very much research on his own. Um, he has a little section that I was just finishing up on uh, where he dangled um, seven 
examples of uh, medieval dragon slayers, saints or either dragon tamers or dragon slayers. And this includes the obligatory St. George um, and uh, um, uh, Tristan and uh, Siegmund and uh, all these various other ones. And supposedly this leads off into the idea that the monster, in addition to the regular dragons that are mentioned in, in Beowulf, that Grendel, the big troll monster, was supposedly a Tyrannosaurus. That's something that's been knocking around, or a Megalosaurus, depending upon if you go over into Kent Hovian land. Um, no. And so uh, there's, there's going to be some wonderful discussions uh, about the background material on this. And one thing that, that when you actually look at these tales about medieval dragon slayers, it, they're just as silly as the Atrahasis and Gilgamesh stories from the Babylonians. It's just as bad. It's just as superficial and tendentious and pulling stuff out of thin air. Um, uh, Ho Hoji even mentions St. Philip. All of his dragon slaying is from Apocrypha, which is ludicrously stupid shit. It's understandable why this never got into the main Bible because nobody should be taking this seriously. And yet, Hoge is apparently taking it seriously because that's all 100% of the evidence for St. Philip slaying a dragon in any way, shape or form comes from Apocrypha. There's nothing about it in the, in the canonical gospels. So the fact that Hoge doesn't mention sources for any of this stuff is a way that he can keep himself distantly removed from the absurdity of the primary source material. So that gives you a little bit of a, um, uh, a heads up on uh, where we're going on there, just as the volume one um, had a, a, is a comprehensive review of the various topics that we discussed. So you can navigate your way around and get caught up on, on where the creationist positions are. We're, we're doing exactly the same thing on all the topics that we're bringing up. Plus there will be one chapter as well that's just bringing updates as to the topics we brought up in volume one that have had new information that's popped up since. So uh, it, it, it'll be a nice little resor uh, resource and is a, will be as thick, I think, as the first volume. Now, speaking of thick volumes, then we've got the stuff relating to part two, um, which is um, an internet creationist um, I was jousting with, uh, tried to bring up Woodmerap, John Woodmerap's 2001 Stupid, on um, uh, the reptile mammal transition. Now, I did a whole chapter dismantling all of Woodmerap's argument. And also because Woodmerap is the easiest to find online if you try to Google the subject, that it's understandable. Oh, aha. Uh, well, the, you're ex the funky part about this apocrypha thing is I don't know that Hoge knows that it's apocryphal. Because remember, Hoge wasn't in fact referencing anything. He just has a little chart where he lists the names across and the, and the supposed date and the supposed location, and that's it. No referencing. So it's entirely possible Hoge never got far enough into the matter to actually figure out where the, the provenance of the material is coming from. Uh, I almost didn't look into this. The only reason I had it pegged in my notes was because of the Grendel matter. And uh, various people, Dapper Dino and others, have called attention to how stupid it was to try to turn da uh, Grendel into a, a dinosaur. Um, ain't a dinosaur. Fictitious, certainly, but not a dinosaur. Um, and it only when I was stopping and I go, wait a minute, Hoge has got a really bad method. He's accepting a bunch of claptrap later on. Maybe I should look into those other saints just for the fun of it. St. Martha and all the rest. And that turned out to be a mother load. I had to do research on um, the various uh, medieval legends and the like. And fortunately, there's been some excellent scholarship that's been done. Uh, Daniel Ogden had written a complete um, a compendium of all the different primary sources in this area, all cataloged by structure and type. So uh, it, it was very, very useful. And um, some of the stuff is, is so tendentious that how anybody could be taking any of those old tales seriously is just another measure of why Hoge and Answers in Genesis can't be taken seriously. So what started out as a thing where I was definitely going to be criticizing him on the stupid stuff about the um, uh, pictograph pterosaurs and all of that has gotten even more 
um, serious because he's shot his mouth off, off on these other subjects as well. So it's awfully fun to deal with. Anyway, uh, back to the, the uh, wood morat matter and the reptile mammal transition. Uh, part of the grouping are um, called dicynodonts. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a, a good one on there. Uh, why turn Grendel into a dinosaur when Beowulf fights an actual dragon? You'd think. Um, and by the way, um, uh, Cooper, who is the guy that's the main pusher of this Grendel theory, he's a British creationist, he decides that the dragon, which, by the way, is a fire-breathing dragon, um, is actually a pterosaur, for which, of course, he offers absolutely no um, oh, a white wait, did dinosaurs die out in the flood or did they? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, only the Kentucky fried chicken dinosaurs survived as we, as we well know, uh, all, all the others went disappear. Anyway, dicynodonts are in, um, that almost mammal bunch that are coming out of the Permian mass extinction. And some have got to be quite large. In fact, uh, um, uh, and were very dominant in through most of the Triassic period. And what happened is that there's a, a, a recent paper from 2019, which is open access. So I'll be linking that as well so people can check up on it, um, where um, uh, our creationist who was defending wood morap and trying to throw wood morap's material at me uh, tried to lob um, a CMI post, which I'll be putting in on this dicynodon. And it's um, uh, the giant that shouldn't be. Bum, bum, bum. And you can see a human being standing next to this big elephant-sized dicynodon. And supposedly, according to the creationist dogma, that, well, this is disproven evolution. They didn't think anything like that could get that big. There were already bull-sized dicynodonts that were known. Nobody in the field is going, oh, my, a bull-sized animal can even get as big as an elephant over the course of many millions of years. Isn't that shocking? And um, what's interesting about it is the placement because it is late Triassic. It's in the ecosystem that's just as the early dinosaurs are starting to come on the scene and also the very earliest of the full-blown mammals are running amok around the scene. Pangaea is beginning to break up. It's a tectonically active area. You've got the Atlantic Ocean starting to form uh, with the Central Atlantic uh, Magnetic Province, the camp. Uh, we discussed a lot of that stuff in the rocks were there, uh, among other things. And um, so the idea that there would have been a quite an active range for herbivores uh, at a time that when the very earliest dinosaurs are just starting to kick in is interesting from a biogeographical point of view and will and will further refine our understanding of the Triassic period before the uh, mass extinction that takes place in the end of the Triassic. Uh, one of the minor mass extinctions, but it was still a mass extinction. Um, and then in the Jurassic period, that whole synapsid line, including early mammals, are really kind of hunkering down and now are getting stiffer competition from the dinosaurs that are proliferating in a world where the climate's shifting, the temporal advantage of being a fur ball, warm blooded animal in a relatively tropical climate is starting to diminish. And so that's when the dinosaurs kick into high gear. Uh, by the end of the Jurassic, we've got the big giant sauropods. Uh, there's a whole different ecosystem going on. And we can guarantee that the creationists are never going to make sense out of any of this stuff in terms of the animals on their own ground, they're not doing any of the work. Uh, I'll be putting a link into that paper um, so everybody can actually read the original uh, 2019 paper on the dicynodonts as well, when I stick the links in on all that. Um, all of that is fascinating work that no creationist does. What's so annoying about the creationist community is how much of dilettantes they are, that they're not actually doing the active work uh, and they just scavenge periodically, picking up little snippets that they then lob into their apologetics and then, by and large, never mention again. Uh, this is quite a, uh, a commonplace motif that you find in anti-evolution. I'm going to swig on my tea. Hot in here. Um, it's, it's a fairly commonplace element that... Anybody that wants to be a specific one, uh, uh, Dan, if you're still in the feed, uh, your area of genetics 
um, anybody that's into geology or any of these other areas. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Yes, yes. I'm your, your evening fix of debunking. And hopefully you'll learn some stuff. You'll have um, the nice thing about reading some of those little papers are that they actually convey information that you didn't know before. And in many of these cases, the um, uh, the Soulege paper on Dicynodonts and the Underhill paper on um, the haplotypes, I didn't know about that work until I discovered it in the course of the creationist research. And so I'm not learning anything from the creationists. They're, they're anti-knowledge. You, you learn, you, you know less after reading a creationist art, article than you knew before. Um, oh, <laughs> Uh, Matt Powell put up such a stupid anti-evolution video, he took it down. That, Yeah, and, and given his track record of stupid videos, I've commented on a couple of them on this show just in the last couple of weeks, that preposterous dino farting video that he put up. I mean, it's just, he's, he's an ignoramus. He's a, a, a very well-dressed, overconfident ignoramus, but, but an absolute ignoramus. And um, um, for something to to get to the level of stupid that even he knows he's bit off more than he can chew. That's an interesting little thing. Um, um, if somebody, when, once the video posts up, uh, somebody can put a comment or something in the um, a chat in, um, in the finished video to uh, bring up, if they have a link to that, whatever that topic was, if somebody archived Matt's video or what the topic of it was, if somebody was discussing it, I, it may very well pop up on the various people that study them. I know Dapper Dino kind of keep tracks of, keeps track of Matt Powell. Oh, Matt, the air and space Powell. Yes, yes. Matt Powell seemingly thinks there's an atmosphere in space, which is news to everybody that knows about space. Uh, technically, I suppose you could argue interstellar space has about one atom every cubic meter in interstellar space. Not much to breathe at that level. Remember how small atoms are. You know, one little hydrogen atom in there. Uh, hydrogen is extremely uh, common in the universe. It's the first atoms that form. And because of that gravity stuff, they kind of clump together and have formed galaxies, but there's still attenuated material. And probably even to this day, or in the next hundred years, we'll still have people trying to figure out why things clump into galaxies the way they do. We now know more that they act like a seed corn, like a pearl around black holes, that black holes form initially and drag material into it. So galaxies relate to some of that stuff. And then there's all the black, the dark matter material, which um, I figure has probably a lot to do with a lot of this issue that future physicists will work out. And we can guarantee none of those physicists will be creationists. They will never have worked any of that stuff out. So um, oh, yes, Don Giovanni says that's how the sun burns, according to Matt. Yes, I think sunburning has affected Matt in some way, but not in relation to how solar physics works. That's that's an entirely different kettle of fish. Anyway, um, the reason that I was talking about the book hyping on the um, uh, reptile mammal transition matter is that I made the Woodmorap paper from 2001 a centerpiece because it is a characteristic example of creationist deck stacking. It's an argument that's constantly being invoked. In fact, anybody that reads the rocks or the um, evolution slam dunk will be ahead of the game on this one because if a creationist pressed about the reptile mammal transition has to do a quickie Google search to find ammunition to go after the terrible godless evolutionist, uh, odds are they're gonna hit the Woodmorap article or it gets alluded to because this um, posting on the Dicynodonts explicitly links to the Woodmorap article. So you can find it by uh, that route, by the way, you can, you'll be able to link hop skip. And so I didn't bother putting in a link to Woodmorap's 2001 thing. You can find it through their thing as well. Um, <laughs> oh, oh dear. Yes. I, I do remember that. I do remember seeing that if there are, whoops, um, got there. Uh, if there are African Americans, why are there still Africans? Yes, that's um, that sounds like a Matt Powellism, doesn't it? Though um, he he's a person. You know, there's the old uh, bit about a uh, mind is a terrible thing to waste. Matt may be the exception to that. I don't think there's anything in there that one could bother about wasting. Um, oh, 
Oh, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're moving on the side, but this is so hilarious. I got to call Tess. Praise and I am said the other day that airplane propellers kill air molecules. He compared all air molecules to embryos. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, there are more air molecules than embryos. And um, there we go. Um, once you have a mind untethered to reality, is there any wonder that it can kind of flit around and make weird analogies and that like that? And such people vote in constitutional societies and some of them even get into Congress and some of them occasionally can even be president of the United States. And it doesn't go well, does it? You know, it could be governors of Florida, people that have minds just exactly that way, who can mix up dogmatic preferences with um, cherry picking bits of information and then maybe not bits of information like living air molecules. Uh, phew. Um, before you all get panicky at the fact, oh my heavens, what a crop of stupid people we have nowadays. I have no reason to think the incidence of those sorts of minds are any greater now than they were a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago or a hundred thousand years ago. It's just that we see them really easy. Yes, Marjorie Taylor Greene comes instantly to mind as somebody. Um, and there are quite a few um, ones that have come perilously close to getting it. Marjorie Taylor Greene just kind of snuck in um, in her election. Whether or not she gets reelected next year, we don't know in, in the midterms. Um, but the fact that she got in at all is a sad state about the electoral system. There have been oddballs who have gotten into political office before, and there have been flaming racists and all sorts of weird people have been in various positions over time. Um, we are in a situation now where we hear about them very quickly. So it's it anybody that makes a stupid statement instantly is online and it's in Twitter and social media and Facebook and all the rest. So it's it's they're way more visible than they were before. And we can even see things in other countries as well because the international media is so vast. So to some extent, it's just a matter of reporting where we observe the people in their habitat more directly rather than kind of after the fact, after they dusty died and, and somebody is looking through old newspaper archives and finding out about a lot of the things they said that way. Um, so that that's in part a data selection issue. It, however, can be actively Immediate, uh, or uh, aggravated by the fact that social media allows information to ricochet way faster than it did in the pre-era. Uh, if all you were running off of was um, uh, what you could mimeograph and what you could pass around by photocopies and what you could talk about physically in front of lectures, some idiot can get on YouTube and can be seen by a million people in the right contexts far more so than any person could have possibly done in previous times. And so uh, people who have been analyzing what happened in the 2016 election uh, and afterwards about how it, misinformation spreads in the uh, internet, um, to their chagrin discovered that lies actually do spread faster than the truth. So the conventional argument that you know, you can use the truth to combat the lie, and that's why you don't want to suppress information and, and uh, um, put bans on things. Also has to deal with the fact that the falsehoods can spread so quickly. And if the people that you're trying to persuade are operating in an insular network where they will, won't believe what you say. So offering information to them won't do any good. Well, it doesn't come from Newsmax, does it? Well, then it can't be true. And that is um, um, can get to be um, a self-referential system. The insularity that we see, uh, certainly we can observe it among the Trumpistas. Uh, uh, more than enough people have followed very closely the, the insular network um, and where Fox uh, News has had to continue to push conspiracy thinking because they're afraid of their losing their audience to the more extreme Newsmax and Onan. And so you get into this spiral of insularity where they're just spinning around in a confirmation bias loop. Uh, and when you try to interrupt that loop, the only thing that will kind of interrupt it for some, not all, 
unfortunately, is reality as in the COVID, where people who were thinking, oh, COVID is just a hoax, are now sitting with a ventilator attached to their lungs and realizing, uh-oh, no, this isn't. Uh, that has changed the minds of some people to kind of pull back from that. But there are others who are just impervious, the extreme Tortukan minds. And I would put Taylor Green as an example of that. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, somebody's talking about something being going on a on a on a soundboard. P.S. Peter will come up with a lot of funky little things. I uh, one of these days I'd like to have a various soundboard and stuff in that too. But uh, I'm still running off of an extremely um, rudimentary operation here. Uh, the main thing is is to get information out and to get the whole point of the method out. Um, the one thing, and I'm I'm an arrogant bastard, so I'm the, not the best person to say how to present information in such a way that it will wiggle its way past the barriers of a Tortukan mind. I don't claim to have that expertise. I'm too, I'm too annoying uh, to do that. Teachers have to think about this though. And, and various people have been studying how you present information in a school context, for example, and this would apply in an individual context as well, that you gotta do it in little bits that are kind of personal to get them to kind of start thinking on their own. And that's a skill that as an arrogant bastard, I don't necessarily have. I just will say, this is what the facts are and pay attention to it. And if you're not gonna do that, well, poo. Um, but people who wanna have a greater personal effect at that grassroots level can't do the way that I'm doing it. They're going to have to figure out what is the appropriate information that could be presented in a little dose to get somebody to start thinking about more information on their own and marshal their brain in that direction. And I don't claim that it's an easy thing to do and it's a, a branch of, of education. Um, but nonetheless, as a society, more of us who have that skill are gonna have to do that because we can see that the price of letting Tortukan nutballs run amok to the point where they get in political power, we can't tolerate that. The rest of us aren't that stupid. And, and we have to use more methods questions. Uh, people need to be vetted before they get into office. At the very least, they need to commit themselves on an awful lot of, of methods points that, that ground them in empirical data field. So the obvious one in relation to creationism is how old do you think the earth is? Do you accept that life has evolved over that time? Independent of whether you think any God is involved as well, is it evolution or not? And those questions get asked to a certain extent in polling data, but remarkably little of politicians. And often we only find out just how wackaloon the politician is after they're in office and starting to tweet crap like Jewish space lasers. And um, uh, it, that's locking the barn door after the barn is burned down. That's not a wise idea. So everybody in terms of local media, in terms of individual citizens, uh, when they're quizzing constituents uh, or, uh, and people at uh, most, not all, but most um, uh, politicians still hold like town halls now and then. They're often highly contrived and controversial. Uh, my um, Republican um, uh, representative Kathy McMorris Rogers kind of treats them as kabuki theater. She kind of manages what questions are in there. They usually get, she's controversial enough that they're often huge audiences. This was in the days before uh, COVID restrictions. Um, and so winnowing out decent questions, and she's also good at sidestepping a lot. But um, other local representatives in the state house and that are really good and informative at, at that level of um, um, Q and A at uh, feedback things that are conducted uh, so that they can interact with their constituents. And if your representative isn't doing that at all, or congressman or senator or whatever, why not? What are they afraid of that they are not willing to interact with their voters? That's all part of the circumstances on it. Um, yeah, the uh, um, I've I've heard that quote from Einstein, and I haven't checked its provenance to find out whether or not he actually said it. It could very well have been said by him. Although one little um, Q element that's pure methods and will always act as kind of like an inoculator for your own brain is 
never take a quote at face value. I don't know that that's an Einstein quote. I've seen it put up with Einstein's name on it, and it may very well be an Einstein quote. Uh, I don't contend that it's it sounds implausible from that point of view. Sometimes it might be under what provenance it was done, and then I would want to know what year it was in, and it changes about, you know, you can say in circumstances on things. So just as a general principle, um, always look the gift quote in the mouth and, and ideally try to pin down where it actually occurred. So I have a, a limited repertoire of... Uh, quotes that I will sometimes toss out that I particularly love because I think the person said them so well that I can't beat them. But I know where they got I got them from. And I know directly from the primary source text. So I don't have to attribute it. I'm not scavenging around online in that about it. Um, the two I like the most, uh, one from William James back in the 19th century, uh, where he um, uh, said, um, uh, the Bible is so human a document, I don't know how belief in its divine authorship can survive the reading of it. I can't beat that. That's superb. He wrote that, I think, in answer to a, um, uh, an interview um, a post um, in uh, 1904, somewhere around in that period. And then um, the other that I love uh, was in a debate that Christopher Hitchens was in, and I think this was leveled at specifically Dinesh D'Souza, but he was talking about all that anthropic reasoning that so many of the religious apologists like to do. And Hitchens said, you're trying to, to, um, you're trying to sneak God through customs without uh, declaring him. And I thought that was such a pithy, compact way of saying how they're trying to bring their, their specific God along the coattails of a generic Kalam style deity that I love quoting that one because it's 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 a delicious little line on there. So anyway, um, <laughs> um, anybody got any specific questions on here before I turn into a melted puddle? Um, uh, we I've covered the um, uh, Woodmarat matter. And anybody that wants to know about that reptile mammal transition thing, get my book. Uh, I'm very proud of the thing. Uh, uh, Christine Janis, the paleontologist, uh, recommended it highly. Uh, she's a working mammal paleontologist, and, and she was delighted with the content of the thing. It's, I'm very pleased with it. And it does, in fact, cover a topic that has not been covered anywhere else in this way, which means you'll get the whole skivvy on who has discussed the reptile mammal transition, both in the intelligent design movement and creationism. And an awful lot of the material is not available online in any form or another. So, so many of the criticisms that have been made of, of the reptile mammal transition by the intelligent design movement are in books, not online. Very little is involved in the Discovery Institute online on this. Whereas I go into all that material and it's not only just the reptile mammal transition, I'm discussing feather evolution because Michael Denton makes a big blunder on that subject. And there's a lot of subjects that get brought up along the way in order to make sense out of all of it. Um, so that that one is a, a shameless book plug. In fact, uh, speaking of shameless plugs, I should make a point of showing my exciting uh, commercial for The Rocks Were There and um, that um, Dear Peter put up. Do, 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 do. Let's get our little screen going here. I sometimes forget to put the advert up and we will proceed accordingly this time and because it's now the point where you actually get to hear the sound i will be a little quieter whilst we get our material out the thickness of the book is not an illusion it is a thick book it was literally pushing the limits of how big you could get a work through amazon and volume two will be comparable to that thoroughly indexed detailed charts in the appendices about um, geochronology and uh, the amino acids and uh, phyla that uh, will be a wonderful reference and all carefully documented with material that's up to date. So um, if you like to annoy creationists, um, this one is a great one to get because it discusses so many of them and recent ones, including online ones, that it's a good coverage. So um, the rocks were there, straight science questions to bent uh, um, creationist questions. Um, it's primarily about the um, answers in Genesis works, but there's a hell of a lot of additional material 
uh, from the intelligent design movement, um, the material on David uh, or no, Richard Lenski's uh, long-term uh, evolution experiments brings us into some other people involved. So, uh, oh, I've seen quite a few of your stuff. I'm not sure whether that's the specific one that um, um, is covering. Uh, make a point of, of uh, lobbing a link to me over in Twitter uh, when I get back onto that afterwards. Um, the My understanding of what... Um, is that there are relatively few people in the creationist community that are outright dinosaur deniers. Um, Alex Stein, who I have debated on that point, was was an example of one, but of course he's an idiot, flat earther, titanic, um, sinking conspiracy theorist, nutball. Uh, so I would kind of expect him to have that kind of attitude. Uh, I, I, my um, experience with it prior to that related to uh, how it was popping up now and then among homeschooling Adventists. And whether or not it's broader than that is another question. So hit me up on that and, and uh, um, I'll, I'll check to see if I've got that in my reference base or not. And if not, there's a relevant little spot in the new book where I'm bringing up the issue of people who are doubting that dinosaurs exist at all. And this is from what I can see from my research, it looks like a relatively homegrown stupid trope. Because clearly nobody at AIG and ICR and CMI, the heavy hitter creationists, are not arguing that dinosaurs are fictional. And so this is basically something that's uh, going on in the, uh, the basement era uh, of that. Uh, Eric says he's putting it on DVD and can send you a copy of it. I will be very much delighted to see that. Yes, indeed. It's um, um, a, 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 all the matter that I know full well how difficult it is to be aware of everything. I try to be as aware of as much as I can, but that's the whole advantage of a network of people to where if everybody is sharing information conveniently, then everybody can get up to speed together and individuals can be working on individual projects to where they can be point person. And then when they come up with a point, then, then people can verify it. So there's a peer reviewed structure on things. Dan uh, Stern Cardinale and Erica and Jackson knows full well that all the stuff that they post or that, that is written, I cross-check their references and make sure that they're all accurate. And just like I expect everybody to do it with me, that um, everybody can make a mistake now and then to err as human, but to correct requires sound method. And if anybody has got solid analysis, the, the, the thing they are least afraid of is somebody checking their sources because they should know that they've constructed an argument that is solid and well-documented. And so that's why all of that's on there. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, uh, James, how long do you think till they have to acknowledge full-blown evolution? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, Joel Duff uh, has been doing some uh, research on um, the, the current brand of creationists. And he's been doing a bunch of posts, which we'll be alluding to in the new Rocks Were There book, um, that... Uh, Kurt Wise and uh, some of these others uh, that are at the at the point argument of baromenology and some of the, the the new breed of creationists are in the process of mutating the doctrines that the hyperspeciation thing that's becoming accepted at that level in creationism, the um, change in how continental structures and things are working, um, huge swaths of what would have been thought of as heretical are becoming part of the mainstream creationism. Answers in Genesis's Ark Encounter has a, a created type giraffe that is exactly what the Dwayne Gish era creationists would have said was impossible. It's just a short necked giraffe. And so they're basically conceding gigantic swaths of evolution in part because they have to. There's no way that you can book the Ark with more than 1,500 kinds er, thereabouts, which means you've got to account for how you get the fossil record and the extant species thing. You need a colossal amount of hyperspeciation, far faster than what evolutionists are allowing. So now they're caught in a bind of denying speciation practically and yet accepting it spectacularly. And, and th that's a ping pong that's never going to connect up properly. But, but creationists are perfectly capable of having mutually contradictory ideas at some stage. And there we go. Um, 
So creationism has already evolved. In fact, oh, uh, 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 David Neff and I on Friday are going to be discussing uh, the um, uh, evolution of creationism from really in from the 19th century forms into the kind of weird, unsure what the hell to think 1930s brands that eventually crystallized in the young earth creationist movement and outliers and then the intelligent design movement that's coming along like a little pimple reaction that that is in an awkward thing so there's an awful lot of dynamics to discuss on that stuff and uh, we'll be going into all that um oh do 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 yes <laughs> oh it says that lee uh, that um uh, it says as soon as the flat earthers believe in a globe yeah that from a methodological point of view a uh, flat earth is the extreme fringe in terms of numbers of people very few flat earthers although there was one that was running for congress down in i think i can't remember whether it was california or georgia and almost got the nomination and so they might still have a, a political career in what's left of the republican party we'll see um but normally they're very very trivial and irrelevant but they are an exemplar of bad method if there's one thing that is really settled, it's that the earth is not flat. And yet you find people, Alex Stein and others, who talk themselves into thinking that it is flat. How do they do that? Well, it's a pile up of secondary citation. Usually in this modern era, it's not written material, it's um, videos that they've seen online. And so they've seen the picture of Chicago in the telephoto lens through the uh, uh, um, particular brand of camera, I can't remember if it was the 901 or something like that, that, that pops up over and over and over again. And you can't get them off of that. And for those who um, caught my debate with uh, Stein and uh, 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 Theo was on my side and uh, Rose was on Stein's side, kind of half, um, on whether the Titanic actually sunk and, or it was instead swapped out with the damaged Olympic. Um, the method that he was using in that argument is indistinguishable from what he does with the flat earth. And it's indistinguishable with how anybody believes something which isn't true. And so when you move outwards, rippling outwards into the geocentrism um, paradigm and then outwards into the young earth creationist paradigm and then outwards into a generic squishy anti-evolutionism, um, the content is shifting. The veneer is altering. The dogmas are filtering along a spectrum, but the method's still the same one, bad. It's over-reliance on secondary sources that you don't fact check. And that's why um, it's so critical to document where things are from and document what, how do we know things are what they are for facts and uh, any conspiracy theory that requires practically the entire planet to be in on it is probably not feasible but if you're a limitless conspiracy person like Alex Stein, it's effortless to do. So uh, that kind of puts that, it's always a matter of, um, uh, I'm not sure what a um, uh, Weniscus is, uh, Lisa. Uh, I think you'll have to explain that. Um, it's not a term that pops up. I may, I may know of it for what it refers to, but by that term, I have no idea. Now, what I just did here was something that is very important to do in all cases. If you don't know, just say so. I don't know everything. Nobody can know everything. Um, but the point is, is whether or not we move on with it. So um, give us a, um, uh, a little explanation there of what a winiscus is. I'm supposing that the M is kind of silent in there. Or you have to do it through a personal lips or a, a wuniscus. Um, it sounds like it could be some kind of a body part. Uh, is that circular thing on a liquid in a test tube? Ooh, uh, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, on a liquid in a test tube. Ah, oh, is that referring to the, uh, um, in effect, the dynamics of how um, stuff flows on a, uh, a moving earth or something like that? That that's, um, that, uh, that could be the matter of it. Anyway, uh, for me. Um, the astronomical problem is catastrophic for flat earth. Uh, there is literally no young earth creation. Ah, so it was just M-E-N. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the W was a ye old typo. There we go. And again, everybody's fingers fill up, flip up once in a while. Me working on this laptop is particularly frustrating because the keyboard is 
flat that I'm not used to typing on. And so my clumsy fingers uh, will glip up on that uh, easily enough. Anyway, um, so the flat earth is, is an exemplar of that. And then we move into views that have far more impact for stupid. Uh, the COVID anti-vaxxer thing is far more serious than any flat earther can ever get because people are dying because of it. it, it it's prolonging the mess that we're in with the Delta variant that um, uh, and, and is now an indication of such needless death because we have vaccines available on that. Nobody drops dead because of uh, belief in flat earth. Um, nobody is ever actually going to go, the flat earther is not going to actively go down to Antarctica and try to find the measure the ice wall. None of them have that much gumption. Um, none of them are actually going to rent um, a, a rocket ship and, and prove that you're not actually going up in space. Um, they're not going to pull that off. It'll be interesting though to see how flat earth evolves or shrivels once space tourism starts becoming popular. And if we start putting permanent moon bases and people actually go there as tourists, um, how easy is it going to be for somebody to scream at somebody at the spaceport proclaiming that, no, you didn't go to Clavius. Don't give me that. We'll find out what's going on. That will obviously not be in the immediate future, but, you know, 50, 100 years from now, we'll see how that goes. So we'll see where we are on that one. Um, do, 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 do. Robert Berkinson, who is that person in here? Um, do, do, do. I know you can't debunk my video. Um, is is Berkinson a, uh, what, what is Berkinson's position? I didn't catch that in the, uh, the stream. Can someone summarize that for a moment? Um, I can't remember whether or not if he was, if he is a flat earther or an anti-evolutionist or any of those things, I'm, uh, I will stipulate that you firmly believe everything that you say in your video. Uh, yeah, oh, the troll, the troll alert guy. Yeah, he, I think he popped in a little bit last week um, uh, on that matter. But um, I'm doing a video. Other people do videos. But the proof is in the documentation that you give and the proof is in the bigger world. Nothing I say here is going to change any of the facts of the world. They are what they are. But hopefully the material that I've been putting up one week after another and become a patron if you can, um, uh, that that can act as a prod and a springboard for somebody to look into something else. And, and plus you find a, a lot of neat shit. We're living in a fascinating, wonderful world of scientific discovery that is accessible to people without any money uh, on a scale that was unprecedented even a few decades ago. So how can anyone not be joyful at that? It's delightful, the amount of information that we have accessible. We can we have add, added our fingertips with our mouse and a mouse click away and on our smartphones and all the rest. And so there is absolutely no justification for uh, dumb. Uh, Robert, um, uh, have you accounted for the reptile mammal transition data? No creationist has so far, and I don't think you're going to pull off an argument that's any better documented than poor Robert, uh, than um, John Woodmerack could do. So um, by all means, give it a whack. But um, you write a monograph that explains this in such a way that it persuades the working paleontologist that you're right, then get back to me. Simply putting up a video is worthless absolutely worthless. It's just spitting into the wind because there's a big world out there that ain't changing based on you. So on that crowd, we put up our advertisement for the rocks were there. We've uh, mentioned the a plug for the other book as well. Um, um, did a shameless uh, beg for people to become patrons of the project. Let everybody you know about the project, tell everybody about what's going on in here, subscribe and like, and all the things you do with YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth and so on. Uh, if you aren't vaccinated, get vaccinated. Stay safe, follow the, 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 the guidelines that are put out. If your governor is an idiot and tells you to, to do something that's stupid, don't. Um, and um, we'll try to get through this and get back on the progress train, which is what I rather like. So uh, see you all next week. Um, everybody stay safe. Hopefully it'll be a little cooler next week. We'll be past a lot of the heat wave here, hopefully by next Wednesday. And uh, I may be able to even put the bloody light on there because it'll be cooler. So bye-bye till then.